All right. So for folks that are trickling in, um, thank you all so much for being here. This is the OPD Youth Defender Series, um, part one of our two-part training, um, focusing on representing youth and young people who are dealing with uh, mental health issues, behavioral health issues, um, and trauma. And um, we have brought together a group of people today who are um, working across the state to provide services to so many um, of our clients that we serve as well in the behavioral health arena. Um, and George um, and I sat down together um, with these folks a couple um, months ago and had a conversation about the work that they do, the services they provide. Um, and we really felt that anybody um, who's representing young people in the criminal legal system um, in court in any way um, can kind of benefit from this information and the resources that they know about um, and sort of the information that they have about how to access those resources. Um, it's a complicated system much like our own. Um, and so I think we have a lot to learn um, from listening to um, these wonderful people that have agreed to speak with us today. Um, I am going to, instead of reading through all of their bios, I'm just going to go ahead and put a link with, um, or sorry, a document with all of their bios in the chat. I'm also going to provide you a copy of um, the handout that was sent out in an email when you registered. Um, or I think it came out yesterday or the day before that can help you with kind of contacting them and navigating this system a little better, and as well as a PDF um, copy of the presentation that you'll be seeing today. We're going to ask that any questions be held until the end. Um, since it is a panel, they'll um, kind of each talk about um, their own avenue, and then hopefully at the end, if there are remaining questions, we can get to those kind of give um, a little more time for that. So I am going to turn it over to Lisa Daniels, who um, is the long-term program or CLIP coordinator for the state of Washington. Um, and she's really been instrumental in bringing this wonderful group of practitioners together. So we really appreciate it. Lisa, thank you for working with us on this. And I will turn it over to you and then put those documents in the chat. Great, thank you. Um, well, I just wanted to- Lisa, uh, I think we can't hear you, so are you? Um, I, oh, I can hear you? her. I can hear you. I can hear her too. We can hear you. Sorry. Okay. Oh. okay, great. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so I work at the Children's Long-Term Inpatient Program Administration, and later in our presentation today, I'm gonna give you some information about CLIP. Um, but we're actually gathered here today to try to give you an overview of the mental health system in the state of Washington, at least the parts that we're the most familiar with. Um, and we're going to start with Gina and Vanessa, and um, I'll turn it over to them. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. Vanessa, go ahead. All right, Liz, you have our PowerPoint? Cool. My name is Vanessa Adams. I'm the program coordinator of Kids Mental Health Pierce County. Uh, Kids Mental Health Pierce County is a community coalition of agencies, providers, um, people in Pierce County who came together several years ago recognizing the state of behavioral health in um, our county and the challenges that we were facing and the the, really the idea that these are all of our young folks and that if all of our systems and all of our community partners didn't come together, make some adjustments and work together, then we were never gonna serve these young people well. Um, we held a summit, created priority actions, and we're able to really focus on um, three priority actions in our county. From there, we moved forward with seeing what we could do, how we could support our young people um, and as many of you know, all of us know, a pandemic happened, a global pandemic happened and we had to shift. But the foundation of this core group and these people with shared ideas, understanding of how we could better support our young people, um, we just started moving forward with the idea that we were planning to um, do in, the, in before with coming together as community partners, building a behavioral health system that was intertwined. We can go to the next one, Liz. Um, that was interconnected and so really, 
the understanding of, of community, the focus of community. Um, the, here is some information uh, from the governor's office recognizing a behavioral health crisis. But as many of us know that work um, in law enforcement, work in behavioral health, work in healthcare, work at Lean Legal, we know that it what didn't start from the pandemic. We were experiencing a behavioral health crisis long before the pandemic. Um, from the, the pandemic, resources were strained. There were definitely impacts uh, on the workforce and there were additional challenges, but the understanding that our community and coming together was so important and crucial that no single entity, no one person was going to solve a problem. No one system was responsible for this, really held true and really was a foundation of the work that we did. You can go forward. And so here's a slide that we, a uh, picture that we really just appreciate. We think that this is just so helpful to understand. It is um, very central to the work of social workers that these are all of our young people. The, an individual impacts a family, a family impacts a community, which impacts the environment and society. For Mental Health Awareness and Acceptance Month, the focus that we just ended and happy pride also, but we, we really focused on um, the environment, the environment around us and the way it impacts our mental health. And so with looking at that, we understand that there are things that you, that are out of your control. There are things in our environments that are out of control, but working together to improve them, to focus and support one another was a focus of our coalition. So creating the the Kids Mental Health Pierce County Coalition. We worked for several years creating these priority actions, building our teams, and the, the core of what we do at Kids Mental Health Pierce County is relationships. Um, we have built such strong relationships in our community. Uh, to, there are several folks that are on the panel that are part of our Kids Mental Health Pierce County multidisciplinary team meetings, our steering committee, and just really knowing that what we do together is going to help our young folks in the long run. So from that point, um, the Kids Mental Health Pierce County has grown, has increased, and now is going to be moving to statewide work in replicating and duplicating um, the ideas, but making them unique to each community. So Gina, I'm going to pass it over to Gina to talk about what that looks like next steps going forward. Yeah, thanks, Vanessa. So when Vanessa talks about like there's some core components, but then it's also going to be catered to each community, there's a couple of key pieces that go through this entire program. So this program has grown from Kids Mental Health Pierce County to being the Youth Behavioral Health Navigator Program that truly is statewide. So it's a partnership with our healthcare authority friends, uh, DEA, and of course, Kids Mental Health Pierce County. And what we do at the Kids Mental Health Pierce County side is provide that technical assistance of here's some lessons learned in our community, maybe here's some time templates, here's some ideas to try for engagement, for partnership, but knowing that it's going to look different in every community. And so some of those components are having a regionalized website. So there are 10 behavioral health admin service organization regions that divide up Washington state. So those are going to have teams in of three in each and every one of those regions. And if we can go back one slide, please, that'd be great. Um, and so each of those regions have a regionalized website. So you've got all all the different types of resources that are going to be in one area so it's like a one-stop shop if you will because it's very difficult to scour scour the internet on google and trying to find providers and figuring out what the resources are so it's really the entire spectrum of services and it's different types of behavioral health supports because we know it looks different for every single family but having it in one spot with all the partners and how to access them is something that every region maintains locally so that you know what's going on in your community another key component is that every Every region has uh, steering and action committees, and those steering and action committees are made up of community providers, and it's a very intentionally interdisciplinary team so that we're really centering parent and family voice. We've got one of our friends uh, on this presentation that's going to be a part of it uh, later. We've also got the juvenile system involved. We've got youth court judges that are part of our steering committee. We work really closely with the court system to make sure that we're providing diversion through partnership and just making sure that we're serving the kids through all the different providers within the community. So we are talking amongst each other and we're working collectively for moving these uh, visions forward of like, how do we better streamline and coordinate services for our kids and our families? 
Every region is also going to have our multidisciplinary teams where we bring all of the different providers of a community together with a family. We hear from the family what's going on in their own words and what kind of resources it is that they want. And by having all these providers on a call with the family, it gives a better holistic picture of what it is that families are looking for and how we can support. What's really great is that these can happen on a standing basis and they can also happen on an ad hoc basis. So sometimes something comes up that's an emergency situation and so for our region in Pierce County, Kids Mental Health Pierce County, Vanessa's that coordinator. So she sends out a blast and says, here's some background information. And it's not uncommon that within 48 hours, we can have over 20 providers on a call with the family making recommendations. And those can be clinical recommendations and they can be non-clinical recommendations. And then the last thing that every region is participating in is a learning collaborative, is we know it's going to look different in every community across the state. So all of us are learning from and with each other. And we are together actually collecting metrics and data that uh, big picture is going to have some opportunity to influence legislation, policy programs, so that we can learn all together of how to better serve kids and families through the entire spectrum of accessing behavioral health, including all the way up through the CLIP process. So that's something I know that we've learned early that we're going to have some differences that include like what's it look like to implement behavioral health services in a rural community versus a more urban community. Um, what's it like to work with the different tribal nations within an area? What's that process look like? We also know there's not going to be the same provider capacity, especially in rural areas. You tend to have fewer providers. What's it look like for a family that's going to access services through insurance? No insurance uh, if they're going to do a private pay. And so with our program, we serve all kids with a focus of kindergarten through 12th grade. We have a little bit of flexibility there, but it's regardless of who their insurance is and where they live. So really the big piece of this on this slide is where it is, is, is right now. So we've got it in Pierce County because that's where it's originated. Where it's going to also, it's expanded to is the greater Columbia regions. So that's like the Southeast part of Washington state, our Salish community, which is like the Kitsap County area. And then our friends in Southwest, which is like the Vancouver part of the state. What we're very excited about is starting July of this year, we actually have four regions coming on. I know it says three, but we've had a really exciting development where it will be expanding to the Great Rivers community, the Spokane community, and the North Central community. So if I could have the next slide, please. We're also going to be adding our Thurston and Mason community. And I threw a lot of different areas and terms. The best way to find out where it's going to be for who you can have for a local contact is our website here. So it's the kidsmentalhealthwashington.org. If you click on that, you'll actually get an interactive map and it will take you to every region's individual website. So no matter where you are, whether you're a professional, a family, you'll have access to the resources there. So you'll also see which regions are coming online. And we just did a webinar actually last week where the regions that are up and running are talking about how this program's been rolled out, what their lessons learned, some of their early successes. So then we're going to have, as I said, the four new regions that are going to start July of this year. And then in July of 2025, we will truly be statewide where we will have the last regions come on board. So families everywhere and anywhere can get access to these resources in their region. So if I can have the next slide, please. This is our contact information. So if you have any questions or if you've got a family that you would love to support, uh, please feel free to reach out to us and we would love to partner with you. Thank you. And then Liz or Lisa, I could pass it back to you, I should say. Yeah, so I'm happy to do introductions. Our next presenter is Jasmine Martinez. She works at A Common Voice. Uh, running the COPE project, and she also works for the CLIP administration as well. So she's going to talk about COPE. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, yes, hello, everybody. My name is Jasmine Martinez, and I am program manager for a Common Voice COPE project. Um, we offer support to parents and caregivers who are navigating the behavioral health system across the state of Washington. Um, what I like to also say, because that's our contract language, right? Navigating the Washington behavioral health system. Um, what I also like to say is that it, I like to work in a way that is proactive and preventative, not merely reactive. Um, and so even if a parent or a caregiver is noticing a, shuttle, a subtle shift in behaviors and emotions, if a teacher is noticing, if a lawyer is noticing, if the youth themselves are noticing, that is an opportunity to connect with the Common Voice Coat Project. Um, 
And, and we can go all the way through, you know, offering support and accessing children's long-term inpatient. Um, but it's important to know that part of what we're wanting to do is to be a part of um, that preventative work in supporting parents and caregivers. So um, if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide, thank you. So a Common Voice Cope project um, started in Pierce County in 1995. Um, over the last two years, that Grassroots Foundation has now been taken statewide through a contract through Healthcare Authority. Um, what we do is first and foremost, we hold the hope, parent to parent and also family advocate to family advocate. Um, our entire team is made up of parents um, who have walked a road in parenting a child or youth um, with, who is experiencing behavioral health challenges, mental health challenges in the home, school or community. I myself, I was in the field about 20 years ago now. I worked in residential facilities. Um, I worked on the milieu, um, on the floor with youth, never anticipating that I myself would have a son that would someday need to access the highest level of in, inpatient and outpatient care. Um, and since navigating that system, I now have a passion and wanted to return to the field, um, recycling all the pain and the muck that we walked through to come alongside other parents. And every team member, that's what we do in terms of holding that hope for parents and caregivers. We strategize means of accessing the behavioral health system. How do we look at that application differently? You know, how do we work with um, the insurance people? How do we work with teachers? How do we work um, with your lawyers? And this has been a big part of the work that we're doing. Um, and then again, support and collaborating with team members, um, you know, the clinicians, the system partners, the school, the school district. One thing that is really big about what we don't do at a Common Voice Cope project is we are non-adversarial advocates. We are big about being informed and working with the teams that we are, that we are um, blessed and honored to have the opportunity to collaborate with. We also encourage parents in terms of re-evaluating their natural supports. Oftentimes we hear a lot about respite. Where can parents and caregivers find respite for their child? If they are experiencing um, or touching the juvenile justice system, if they're touching and looking um, into children's long-term inpatient, if their child is, is accessing um, you know, uh, care at a hospital, a lot of times the parents are spent beyond the word spent. And so we talk to parents and caregivers about how do we reevaluate our natural supports? That's meaning family members, that's meaning neighbors um, and other natural supports to offer that respite so that parents can take a breather and um, prioritize their wellness for a moment um, because cognitive functioning takes a hit when you are experiencing crisis after crisis. Um, so again, support in accessing and navigating the Washington Behavioral Health System at large. Um, next slide, please. So in terms of direct parent support, what's really exciting um, is that there is zero cost to parents or caregivers. Um, and so regardless of insurance type, so private insurance, state insurance, no insurance, that is not a barrier to parents and caregivers accessing support through a Common Voice Code project. Another thing is that um, youth and children do not have to already be enrolled in mental health services to, for their parents to receive support from a Common Voice Code project. This is really big because um, these are barriers that we see a lot when parents are trying to access support. And so it's fantastic that that's not a barrier um, when it comes to a Common Voice Co project. We also connect families to relevant resources, supports, and services. Um, and then again, support during transitions and graduations into wraparound with intensive services, out of wraparound with intensive services, into CLIP, out of CLIP, um, and then also juvenile justice and residential schooling. Next slide, please. So what we are not, this is a very important slide, um, we are not a crisis line. Um, so we will, res we as every staff member at a Common Voice Cope project will refer parents to their mental health providers um, their WISE teams, 988, 911, when necessary, um, regardless of our expertise, experience, or credentials, um, that is left in a box with the key, and we stay in our lane as parent advocate support. Um, and so that's actually a level three. If a parent calls us and they're experiencing a crisis, we disengage um, and we offer them support towards the necessary and, and um, the experts for that area. Um, and then again, we are a, we are not a do for, but a do with. 
um, we empower parents and caregivers as they are navigating these, um, these stormy times in their lives. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so a Common Voice Co project, our role and aim is to collaborate and truly partner with all teams we have the privilege of working with as we empower, strengthen, and support families. Um, we have a lot of trainings and workshops that we offer towards for parents and caregivers around connecting with their children in the midst of crises. How do we connect with our child in the midst of um, extreme behavioral health concerns? How does a parent not notify or excuse me, identify their own escalation cycle when they see their own child um, reaching that, that red peak? And so these are powerful things behind the scenes that we can do with parents and caregivers. And then lastly, we are compassionate mythbusters. And so meaning there's a lot of misinformation, well-meaning misinformation when it comes to every part of the behavioral health system. And we compassionately pop those myths left and right so that parents and caregivers can hold on to the truth and the facts of the system rather than white knuckling those things cannot that cannot ultimately serve them. I've often said it like if we go to a dollar store, the Dollar Tree, and we look for a Corvette or a wedding dress, we're going to be disappointed. So we, get, we help parents identify what meeting they're in and what they can access through that meeting. Next slide, please. And so my name is my email. Referrals, all referrals to a Common Voice Cope project come directly to me. And we have lead parent support specialists sp spread across the state um, that work with parents directly. And what's beautiful about this little, um, I feel like I'm on the Brady Bunch, so I was going to say that. These squares here, these rectangles, is that we work behind the scenes and interconnect left and right as we support parents and caregivers together. And I think that's what's really powerful is one way or another with this panel, we offer facts and we offer compassionate support as we um, come alongside families together. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Jasmine. Um, our next presenter is Carrie Good. She is from the Great Rivers Behavioral Health Administrative Service Organization, which we call BHASO. And she's from one of our regions and is gonna talk a little bit about the role um, that an ASO has for um, serving kids in our system, as well as CLIP referrals. So Carrie. Thank you, Lisa. Good afternoon. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So real brief for me today, um, I just want to go over, as Lisa mentioned, some of the roles and responsibilities, but I do first want to kind of explain what the Behavioral Health Administrative Services organizations are. I'm just going to, from now on, refer to BHISOs, because that is a mouthful, but um, we cover private, commercial, insurance, non-Medicaid, uninsured children and youth. So that will be the focus that I will emphasize. And then also um, what the intensive services task force team functions are and our connection to the CLIP application and how it all ties together. So next, next slide, please. So as you'll see the regions listed out there below, um, as of January, 2020, all 10 regions throughout Washington State um, have a BHASO. Not all of us do the exact same things, of course, but generally speaking, we do have the, um, a foundation of functions that we are responsible for. Uh, we each um, hold contracts with the HCA for federal and state dollars specifically for behavioral health, which is mental health and substance use disorder treatment um, resources and any other specialty programs that are not paid for or entirely paid for by Medicaid or Medicare. Next slide, please. So, um, as Jasmine talked about not having a crisis line, we do. Uh, the BHASOs in one way or another are responsible for providing a robust uh, regional crisis system for each region that includes 24-7 crisis hotline services, having access to mobile crisis teams, MCTs is another way to refer them, where individuals actually trained professionals go out into the community and meet you where you are 
um, in a time of a behavioral health crisis, um, and also provide access to designated crisis responders, also known as DCRs, for involuntary treatment commitments, also known as ITAs. And this is a service that is available to anyone. It has no ties to your insurance or your status. If you have a behavioral health crisis, you have access to these um, resources for Washington State, I can say. Um, the next section that I wanted to emphasize is that the ASO, BHASOs also have, again, depending on their region and how they've allocated their funding from the state, um, there are potential funding opportunities for low-income individuals who do not qualify. There is, there's this interesting spot where you still make too much, but you don't make enough money to really sustain or, or get services paid for, but you don't qualify for Medicaid because of that income threshold. So we, we often see individuals who are falling through the cracks because they're in that category. But if they do not qualify for Medicaid and they need access to behavioral health services, including uh, crisis stabilization services, also known as CSUs, and any mental health or substance use disorder outpatient treatment, residential or inpatient treatment, and then detox or withdrawal management services. We also um, provide, we have a contract for FISPR, which is the Family Youth System Partner Roundtable. I just wanted to plug in there that this is an opportunity. It's a platform to empower youth, children, youth, and families who need to share what their voice and choice is regarding their care in the system of care. Um, we don't just emphasize behavioral health and FISPR. It, we, we literally are looking at the entire scope of the system of care and, and how, it how it impacts an individual's well-being. But we do provide um, that programming, and it's, it's very, very important. So we're pretty proud of our FISPR. And lastly, I'm going to talk about um, we have a contract to be the facilitators for our regional committee, also known as a task force. Um, that meets any, sorry, we meet together and we review high needs cases, case consultations, and we also review CLIP applications. So I'm gonna go on to the next slide. So the Regional Intensive Services Task Force, I just wanna first say that don't hang on to that name because each region will most likely make it their own and call it something else. Um, for an example, for Great Rivers, our task force name is Great Rivers Youth Community Resource Team. So just keep that in mind, but our functions are the same. And we meet at least once a, uh, once a month. Um, there are some regions that have such a high level of need and case consultations where you may find that they meet several times for several hours uh, in a month based on how many high needs case consultations they have or how many CLIP applications they may be taking a look at. But to break down the, the function of how these task force um, operate, we have two steps. And the first one regarding the high needs case consultations is that we will invite the, the children, youth, family, caregiver, providers, whoever is, is wanting to come to our, our meeting to talk about the needs. Um, that they believe the youth has in all the struggles that they're facing up until this point and also what they have tried. So after our committee hears the case, um, and we also get documentation too to help support their case, after we hear the case, one of the potential outcomes is that our committee may, and we, we do a majority vote, but our committee will either recommend recommend less restrictive alternatives to services, meaning that, you know, ideally we don't want you to have to go to the highest level of care or an institution when you have other resources available to you within your community that may meet your needs more appropriately. And it's more ideal, obviously, to try and keep you within your community, but that's not always the case. Um, so we would either let the applicants know that we actually recommend that you try a lower level of care or maybe you know you 
are Medicaid enrolled and you are not enrolled in a WISE program yet, so maybe you can try that. So we, we give some recommendations. We don't just say yes or no, we have to provide recommendations. Um, or we may hear a case and, and, and recognize that you have tried everything, you have exhausted all your resources, um, you absolutely could really benefit. We see an expected benefit from you applying for CLIP. And so we would make a recommendation for you to fill out or complete your application for CLIP. Next slide, please. So the second part of ours, um, of our committee is that if it's not just a high needs case consultation and a family wants to just apply for CLIP, this is the other part where we recognize that, okay, you're here for CLIP specifically. And if a youth is 13 or older, we, ex we they have to consent to it because we only review voluntary applications. That is, that is very, very important to keep in mind. Um, but of course, if they're younger than that, then their legal guardians can consent for that. Again, same process in that we hear the case and we hope that we can get a, a robust meeting. That's not always the case. Some youth and families don't have a lot of supports to come in and talk, but that's not a requirement. But it is nice when we can get providers or other supports to come and, and help explain what's going on. So the potential outcome for that when we're reviewing a CLIP application is, again, we may still recommend less restrictive alternatives because we have some recommendations to give you that you may have not tried already, or we agree that um, your CLIP application should be moved on to the CLIP administration for their final decision. So one of the things I really want to emphasize is that our committee does not make final decisions on CLIP. Um, we simply make recommendations and the CLIP administration will consider recommendations, but at the end of the day, they make their own. They make their own decisions regarding that. So the next steps in that would be that the child and youth and family would either try our recommendations if they're the less restrictive ones, um, or they'll submit their application. And there are times where we do not recommend CLIP and the youth and family don't agree with that. And that's totally fine. So therefore, there we have an appeal process for that where the youth and family can appeal the committee's recommendations and then apply directly to the CLIP administration. We still just have to go through this process. So I believe this might be my last slide. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so our next two speakers are from a managed care organization. I'll introduce Judy and then Rachel will kind of introduce herself in a bit. But in the state of Washington, we have four managed care organizations and Judy Huyan is here today from AmeriGroup. And hi everyone, I'm Rachel Zakopaiko. I am a Children's Behavioral Health Administrator and CLIP Liaison with Coordinated Care. I am merely on to back up Judy because we do hold the foster care contract, uh, meaning we are the ones to ensure all youth in the state of Washington who are dependent in the foster care system. And we also, um, we also ensure all kiddos who have been adopted out of the foster care system. Um, my background is 15 years of working for DCYF, and then I came over here to work for Coordinated Care, uh, still directly working with our foster care population. Um, so I'm specifically here to answer any questions about that, um, if that comes up in regards to accessing children's long-term inpatient. Um, I'm also um, a liaison who specifically works with all of our children who are identified as uh, Alaska Native or Native American across the state. Thank you. And Judy will do the presentation. Hi, everyone. Judy Hoyen with AmeriGroup. As Lisa said, I am one of, at least my position currently is called a CLIP system administrator for AmeriGroup. And I'll be talking in general about what is, when people hear the word, a managed care organization or an MCO. And as Lisa had said, we have a number of them in the state. 
Um, they different regions have different whatever the contract they made with the state you might have certain managed care organizations in one region and they may not be in others so apple health as we have here in washington offers managed care plans for their regions the role of the plan is to coordinate as i said the physical the mental health and substance abuse disorders so managed care organizations are required to employ both behavioral health case managers and physical health case managers. It doesn't mean they don't oftentimes work together. You may have someone that has both physical and mental health issues or SUD issues. And we certainly can all work together as I do um, in my job. But what's nice as well, they do separate the adult case managers from pediatric case managers. That's, uh, they're, they're very different resources and, and different knowledge base you need for each of those. Next slide, please. So what is the role of a, a case manager? What are the kinds of things they can help with? And this is really just a beginning list. I feel like at times as a behavioral health case manager, we're kind of a jack of all trades when it comes to what can we help with? These are just, you know, providing information if they have health related questions, any barriers like I, I, you know, my car broke down. I don't know how to get to my appointment. How do I get, you know, my child to their therapy appointment? If they're just struggling making appointments, it could be anything. I speak another language and I need help with an interpreter line because that is something the state requires the managed care organizations to have our interpreter lines that we can do three-way calls to make sure we can get that through. Um, I talked about transportation. Each of the regions are required to have contracts with transportation resources so families can get their children to appointments, any medical, mental health appointments, allied appointments. It could be you know, physical therapies and those kinds of things are covered under that as well. We help with any community resources. That could be a family who I, I'm, I'm running out of food. It's getting towards the end of the month, I'll have no money. Where do I go? Um, I need help with my, they're talking about, you know, turning off my electricity. I don't know how to negotiate or can I, what can I do to keep the lights on? You know, I have a child who's, who's on oxygen. I can't lose, you know, certain things like that. And if there might be just medication, trying to understand some of the medication pieces as well. Um, so in general, when you do have a case manager and it's a voluntary service, anybody can um, ask for a case manager from their managed care organization. There's just 800 number on the back of their card that they can call. And there's a variety of other ways of also getting that. But care plans are developed where you come up with goals. We're going to work and it could be as simple as the family needs help with transportation to appointments. That could be a goal. We're going to help them set that up. As pediatric case managers, what's a little different with this is that we probably work closer with certain allied systems than, let's say, adult case managers might. We'll work closely with primary care physicians, if need be, with uh, behavioral health agencies, any other kind of health care providers. It could be, you know, the school nurse. It could be anyone at school. It could be working with a DDA case manager. DCYF um, is pretty common for us to work with them uh, when needed as well. Next slide, please. So as children's clip case manager, which is a little different than the generic, as probably generic's not the best word, a pediatric case manager. And I've done that position as well. Well, like I mentioned, you are a jack of all trades. When it comes to the clip case manager, that's very specific because it's really to help with the whole clip process from day one to whenever that ends. Um, it definitely looks different. So if you have something, be it a child or parent or guardian, and they are interested in CLIP, it's our job as a case manager to educate the family, educate the member what is CLIP, what it is not. Um, you know, trying to get a history from the family. What's going on? Why are you looking at, you know, that service? What, what have you done? What's worked? What hasn't worked? 
and really talking about um, trying to get a sense why are they asking for a clip at this time. Then by, you know, we help the family then each region, as Carrie had mentioned, has their own regional committee. And for instance, me at Amerigroup, I sit on all of those committees all over the state, whereas on some other um, MCOs, you might have more than one clip case manager um, that might sit on part of them and not all of them. So we're there to really help the family, giving them what documents that they need to fill out before going to the committee meeting and helping the family understand what does the meeting look like? How long will it be? How is it organized and safe and so forth? And then it's part of our job to kind of review the documents, make sure they're complete. And then we work closely with the ASO facilitator like in Cary, if it was a case with Great Rivers to work with her to say, okay, we have a family wanting to come to the committee. And, and so forth and hear the folks involved and, and work on the dates that work um, that are available and work with the family. And then at that point, again, uh, this is probably a little repetition what Carrie talked about. If they feel they meet the criteria for CLIP, we will then work with the family, give them the full CLIP document, the application to complete. If they're running into barriers, getting documents, let's say sometimes there's issues with getting psychiatric hospitalization records that are required for kids um, going to CLIP. We can help gather some of that. And then it's our job to review all the, all the different documents needed for the CLIP application, make sure they're complete, make sure they're accurate. And then it's our job to pass it on to the CLIP administration. Then if in the end, the CLIP administration decides that this child meets criteria and so forth, once they then get into a CLIP program, it then continues to be that CLIP case manager's job to follow that child. That will mean some facilities, CLIP facilities, have monthly, for instance, treatment reviews. Some of them meet monthly or then they go to every other month. So we're there to kind of follow along the journey with that child, with that family, answer questions of the family if they're getting confused, what's going on, a concern, whatever. And then it's really our job to really help with the discharge of planning. And that can be everything from where are they then going to go to mental health? Just yesterday, I was in an IEP meeting because we really want to make sure the child's IEP is up to date with good information to help so when that child is discharging and going back to school, the school district has the most updated information to really work on placement uh, for that child when it comes to that. If there are other community resources that we might need, we, we could. And then if families just say, I have other needs beyond that, you know what I mean? I would be. Would need help with in a sense. I would really drop out in a sense of that case. If there's a behavioral case manager from that MCO, that case manager can continue on to provide the other resources needed. Uh, next slide, please. As it shows here, obviously, as a case manager, we obviously have to work very closely with the CLIP administration and the family and the behavioral health team as a whole. Again, like I mentioned, we'll provide the documents to the CLIP administration, and at times they may say, you're missing this, or we really need more of that. It's then our job to work closely again with the CLIP administration and the family to make sure we can gather the information that's needed. And as we need to consult on cases, when there's questions, concerns, whatever, um, that is something that we can do as case managers as well. The CLIP administration is very good with that via we can call, we can text, we can email, all the above uh, works for them. Uh, thank you. Great, okay. So now I'm gonna talk a little bit more in detail about CLIP and if we can move to the next slide. Um, so CLIP, Children's Long-Term Inpatient Program, um, it's the most intensive um, inpatient psychiatric treatment available to youth that are residents of the state of Washington. So CLIP serves kids 
uh, as young as five up to 17 years of age. So when kids turn 18, they're in the state of Washington considered an adult. And at that point, they have to actually um, discharge from CLIP. So we serve kids up to the age of 18. Um, the treatment provided is funded through both federal and state Medicaid. Even if a family has private insurance, often there isn't necessarily a benefit. Um, so they immediately qualify on the day of admission for Medicaid and that is funded. So it isn't a financial hardship for families. It is um, something if they're residents of the state of Washington and meet criteria, um, Medicaid uh, pays for that. Uh, it's a planned course of treatment. CLIP is not accessible on a crisis basis. And we'll talk a little bit more about um, the process and wait times and things like that. Um, and the goal of treatment always really is to stabilize the youth, um, provide them treatment and to um, get them back into their home and community when they are stable and ready. Uh, several years ago, we had a big initiative to really focus on reducing length of stay and increase transitional stages of treatment, um, which was primarily to address our wait list. And um, there were a lot of improvements in uh, the provision of care to really focus on more day passes, more overnights when kids are getting towards that discharge date to really help support a successful outcome through that gradual process of being able to try their skills out at home and families kind of reacclimate. Uh, next slide. Oh, I think we missed one. Yep, what is what CLIP is not. Um, it really isn't a facility or placement for a child to grow up in. Um, our average length of stay is about six to nine months. Um, it's critical that family participation visits um, and uh, participation in family therapy is something that happens um, from very early on. Eventually, as I described, that would also include them taking their child out or going home for a weekend. And so it's really a critical element. And we really think of CLIP as um, family centered as much as possible, even though the child is living at the facility. Um, it also isn't a alternative to a JRA incarceration. Um, we in all the CLIP programs serve a very vulnerable population um, and it is not necessarily secure, although many of our programs are locked, not all of them are. And despite being locked, there are still um, elopements that occur. Um, also through the provision of recreation therapy, many of the programs go out into the community with kids on a fairly frequent basis, as well as passes and home visits um, as a, a important part of treatment. Um, and CLIP is really medically defined and a monitored course of treatment. There is a certification and then recertification process that happens when kids are initially approved. It's for a period of time. And then that has to be um, recertified on a every three month basis. So really kids meeting medical necessity for this intensive course of treatment really has to be attested to on a monthly basis. And when kids no longer are likely to meet medical necessity, that's really about the time discharge planning is moving forward. Next slide. So um, CLIP eligibility. So as I said, CLIP is funded through federal and state Medicaid. And so um, criteria for admission um, is set by federal statute, it's the CFRs, um, and we have a certification team for voluntary applications that look at all the CLIP applications um, to determine if medical necessity is met for kids to enter into this level of treatment. So they need to have a diagnosis of a severe psychiatric disorder that significantly impact their functioning safely in a community, um, that community-based services that are available and appropriate for the child have been tried. You know, they almost all of the children have been in the care of a psychiatrist, typically been on medications, 
Many have had um, psychiatric hospitalizations. That isn't required, but that's kind of the profile of the kids we serve. And they've been in various forms of community-based services. Um, and what the certification team is looking for is that they have that diagnosis and really um, they're now at the level they need to be in a restrictive, intensive, structured psychiatric treatment facility. Um, and this fourth bullet, severe psychiatric symptoms really need to be identified as resulting from a mental disorder and not solely attributed to factors such as primary SUD um, issues or sexual deviancy or intellectual disability. So it's not that kids um, don't have some of those kinds of needs, it just is not necessarily the driver for the referral for CLIP. It really needs to be that they have a severe psychiatric impairment. Certainly we have kids that also have intellectual disabilities, um, autism, and we don't necessarily have a cutoff, but because CLIP treatment is really a cognitively based milieu, there is group therapy, um, you know, individual and family therapy, there is a certain level of functioning um, that is required for kids to truly be able to benefit from CLIP treatment. Um, and then, as I said before, they need to be a resident of the state of Washington. So next slide. So CLIP provides a multidisciplinary approach of individualized treatment. And I have some other slides that kind of talk about those core services that are offered. Um, they focus on treating and stabilizing um, youth psychiatric disorders. Uh, Evidence-based practices are built into all of the CLIP programs that are currently providing treatment. Um, all the facilities are licensed as ENTs, which is an evaluation and treatment um, facility. So they also serve kids on ITAs, individual treatment orders, which I'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, and then parents and caregivers ideally are providing an opportunity to learn new skills and strategies um, to effectively understand their child's illness and better um, manage what their needs are as they um, transition and return home. Next slide. So the two admission pathways to CLIP um, are the voluntary admission pathway, and that's what Carrie and Judy spoke uh, in regards to. So the voluntary screening um, is something that they do at the community level um, for youth over 13, because that's the age of consent in the state of Washington, they would have to agree to a voluntary CLIP admission. But the other option is kids that are placed on 180 day involuntary treatment orders, that would be through a DCR, a designated crisis responder that detains them to a hospital um, on, a, I think the initial hold is a 500 hour hold. And then eventually if the hospital feels warranted to put them on a 14 day hold, um, and then the most restrictive um, longest hold would be this 180 day ITA. And by being placed on 120, or I'm sorry, 180 day hold, they immediately qualify to go on the CLIP wait list. That doesn't mean they have to admit. There are times where kids stabilize within the hospital and they may discharge on an LRA, a less restrictive order, um, but it does give them access involuntarily to CLIP treatment if that's the direction the hospital feels is necessary. Um, one thing to note just in regards to this, um, there is something in statute about family initiated treatment into residential, which is for kids um, over 13 where a parent can require the child to admit to uh, acute hospitalization and there's something in statute about residential. However, there aren't um, currently access to residential under family initiated treatment just on the basis of not enough beds to serve the kids that we currently have. Um, and so FIT is not an access point, nor is a um, criminal or family court ordering that the kid has to go to CLIP treatment. Um, there have been occasions where um, judges have um, thought that that would be one avenue, but it really has to be the mental health court that places a youth on a 180 day order. So next slide. 
So this is just kind of an overview of um, our wait times based on quarters. As I talked about um, several years ago, we had a clip improvement uh, system team that really worked to address length of stay, uh, wait times, and there were some real improvements as you can see back in 2018 in terms of us having ideally less than 30 day wait for CLIP admission. Uh, you can see the impact COVID had and continues to have um, on wait times. And it's problematic. Um, many of these kids, by the time they get through the application process or in a hospital on an ITA are, are definitely in need of this level of care. And you know, waiting on average 141 days is, is very difficult. Um, and it is what it is for now. So uh, next slide. So this is the location of the four CLIP programs that we currently have in Washington State. Um, we did have a CLIP program located in King County close, I believe in 2020, that was operated by Seattle Children's Home and then Navos, um, but it no longer is a CLIP program. So currently the programs that we have, we have one in Spokane, the Tamarack Center, uh, the newest CLIP program that opened um, the Two Rivers Landing uh, program in Yakima actually serves kids. They have two programs. They have a CLIP program and then they have a short-term acute hospitalization program there. So there are smaller CLIP programs serving about six to nine kids. Uh, and then the Pearl Youth Residence, which uh, during the pandemic, they moved and uh, more than doubled their capacity. They are located in um, Tacoma and they serve up to 27 kids. And then our largest CLIP program, which is our state hospital for children, child study and treatment center, um, which has up to 57 beds located in uh, Lakewood. Next slide. So as I said, Two Rivers Landing program, um, six to nine beds on average, they tend to serve six kids. Uh, they have um, an ability to ITA kids. And um, also a, a strength of their program is they have several um, bilingual staff and really have a commitment um, as much as possible to serve kids and families from their local community and um, that obviously provides a great opportunity when families are geographically close to their children in treatment um, to have a greater experience with that transitional phase of care. So that's, they've been a great addition. Uh, Tamarack Center, uh, Tamarack has private insurance beds. There are only CLIP program that serves private insurance kids. So really um, the number of kids they serve kind of waxes and wanes is for CLIP because of um, their private business. Uh, located in Spokane, and um, they tend to be a bit more specific in the kinds of kids they serve. They do not lock their doors. Um, they do not serve kids um, with any kind of intellectual um, deficits or kind of extreme externalizing behaviors. So um, kids that go to Tamarack are um, kind of a specific population. Next slide. Child Study and Treatment Center, so gosh, I'm not sure, 2020 or 2021, a new cottage was funded and opened at Child Study and Treatment Center. So currently we have four cottages. They're divided by age. Uh, Camino Cottage is really the only program um, serving kids actually from five to about 10 years of age. Um, because of the demand, we've, we've shifted Camino and Catron. So really they tend to serve kids five to 10. They have 16 beds and Ketron serves kids about 10 to 13, 14 sometimes. Um, and the Orcas Cottage has 15 beds um, and they serve kids 13, 14, up to 18 years of age. The Orcas Cottage um, is a unique environment in that it is um, uh, designed to have some space within their program that allows for more supervision uh, it was called the Close Attention Program. Now it's going to have a different name like Harbor. Um, but the way it's designed is to manage kids with much more acute safety needs um, or need for low STEM types of environment. It's currently under construction so um, or renovation. So their census is reduced for a few months. And then the San Juan Cottage, which is the 
um, newest cottage that opened. They are um, serving about 10 CLIP kids, and then they have the other part of their program designated for kids that are ordered in for either forensic evaluation on an inpatient basis or forensic restoration. Um, just to be clear, that is not kids getting CLIP treatment. It is a very focused course with the forensic um, psychologist working to help evaluate whether they can assist in their own defense or um, receive education and sometimes medication to be able to participate in their criminal trials. So um, that space opened up and there is a forensic department that um, serves those kids at uh, Child Study and Treatment Center. Next slide. Um, so this is a slide that uh, just gives a little more detail in regards to Child Study and Treatment Center and some of the evidence-based approaches that they um, use there. Uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and, and DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, um, TFCBT. Uh, one of the things they have added several years ago and really have been expanding on is the provision of services and some education to families to help families learn some of the same skills that their children are learning. So one of their family therapists does a DBT skills group to help teach some of the parents some of the skills that their children are learning. Um, and he also facilitates quarterly retreats um, for parents where they can come on campus. And there's a whole host of um, things that they provide during that weekend uh, regarding education on different diagnoses and things like that. Um, all CLIP programs have recreation therapy, group therapy, milieu treatment. Um, all the programs have child psychiatrists as well as psychiatric ARMPs and 24-hour nursing. Um, and as I said before, family therapy, individual therapy is also a critical component that's provided on a weekly basis. Next slide. And the Pearl Youth Residence, as I had said, they recently moved expanding their program. Um, they have uh, a floor where they have two units of 11 and a downstairs floor that serves five kids. Um, one of the things that we started seeing over the past couple of years is really a significant increase in referrals of kids ages 11 and 12, where previously those kids were either Kameno or Ketron age. However, with the ability for um, Pearl to um, have a divided unit, now they are serving kids 11 to 13 years of age on one side of their program and then older adolescents on the other. Um, and because all of our CLIP programs were hit significantly through the pandemic with uh, staffing shortages, they did have to temporarily hold off on admitting to that five bed Fuji unit until they can get staffing up to speed and try to um, begin to reopen that unit. So at the moment they've been holding at a census of 22. Next slide. Um, and these are just some pictures of their new facility. Um, and a video, which I thought we were gonna do if we're, we have time, but I know we haven't um, done questions, so. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and thank you all of you for sharing this information with us. I think it's super helpful and orienting. Um, and I wanna make sure that we, I mean, we're closing. If you have to go, please do, but if you have any questions, please, you can either put them in the chat, you can raise your hand. Um, and I know that um, panelists are here and available to answer questions for a little bit here. All right. Well, if folks don't have questions, which is fine, um, I think that um, you have been given contact information um, in the handout for um, the people who presented today, as well as some other people who are um, helping out youth in these areas. Um, you can always reach out to us and we can put you in touch with folks as well. Um, but what we hope is that um, kind of an orientation to these systems and a little bit of a more comprehensive understanding about 
what your clients might be involved in through these systems will help um, enhance your practice um, and your ability to advocate for these clients who have um, such important needs that we are all trying to um, understand how we can help them meet. So um, thank you all for attending. Um, I know that the CLE credit has already been approved. So um, if you, you should be getting an email, make sure to fill it out, um, showing that you attended and provide us some feedback so that we can continue or hopefully continue <laughs> to provide um, relevant trainings for you all. Um, and we really appreciate your time and happy Friday, everyone. And thank you so much to our panelists um, for taking the time to do this. It's really, really, 